June the 2nd, 1994. There is 29 souls on board. A Chinook helicopter has crashed. Everyone on board is dead. They include Northern Ireland's top anti-terrorism experts and one of the Royal Air Force's most experienced crews. Flight Lieutenant Jonathan Tapper was a superbly qualified and dedicated member of that force. When the report is published, tragedy turns to shock and outrage. I can't see how you can accuse people of being negligent without having any proof for it. A firestorm of controversy ignites over what really happened on that barren hillside. Disasters don't just happen, they're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Northern Ireland. Belfast. May the 31st, 1994. The British Army is on high alert in the face of the IRA's ongoing terror campaign. 0730. Irish government sources believe the provisionals may not stop the violence during the lifetime of this government. At the military base RAF Aldergrove, Flight Lieutenant Jonathan Tapper arrives for work. Morning. Morning. IRA hardliners are believed to be holding out for a declaration from the British government that it is willing to withdraw from Northern Ireland. Tapper is a Special Forces helicopter pilot. A new class of the giant Chinook, the HC-2, has just arrived for use in the troubled province. The identity of the group responsible for planting a car bomb in Tempo, County Fermanagh, yesterday remains a mystery. The RAC believes the bomb which exploded in front of the police station has the hallmarks of the provisional IRA. After 14 years service with the RAF, the Chinook has undergone an extensive refit. New computerized control systems mean flying the Chinook is much simpler for the pilots. It's been a few months since Tapper's training on the new aircraft, and he's keen to re-familiarise himself with it. Hello, Steve. How's she looking? She's looking OK, sir. The forms are all filled in. Brilliant. Great stuff, thanks. No problem, sir. Tapper's been ordered to fly in the new Chinook the day after tomorrow. Yeah. But with a high level of terrorist activity, his mission remains classified. Hello, Dad. Hi, yeah. yeah it's John. How are you? Later that day, Tapper expresses his concerns about the new helicopter in a call with his father. There, there's a few teething problems, I think. A couple of things not quite clicking, but uh, we'll, we'll see. I actually asked if we could take out one of the old Chinooks. They, they said no. Yeah, no chance. June the 2nd, 1994. 0945. This is Foxtrot 4, Juliet 40. Are we clear to lift and taxi to departure point? OK, can we just... I just hold on. Steady. I just steady. Clear above and behind. Clear to lift. Tapper lifts off in the new Chinook for the first of the day's missions. Piloting Zulu Delta 576 is Flight Lieutenant Richard Cook. A spate of IRA attacks on British soldiers means road transportation is unsafe. Tapper's crew are flying troops around bases in Northern Ireland. Certainly less vibration than the old ones. Communication between the nav here. Not the same reading as the map. Fifteen twenty. After a series of short flights, the Chinook returns to RAF Aldergrove. 
Tapper's concerned. There's inconsistent readings on the nav computer, and the power's a bit jumpy. We'll get our crews on it right away, sir. Okay, thanks, Chief. No problem. Thanks, sir. Tapper's next mission involves a higher level of security clearance. His crew is to fly 25 of Northern Ireland's top anti-terrorism experts to a conference in the north of Scotland. 1,600 hours. All right, lads. Ahead of the flight, Cook and Tapper conduct a sortie brief with their two crew members. Well, this is in our favor. Mostly clear, but there's a 30% chance of poor visibility on the mole. We're flying VFR. VFR, or visual flight rules, allow the crew to fly at low level, navigating by eye rather than instruments. Our first waypoint is the lighthouse here on the mole. We'll continue in a northerly direction, hugging the coast along the west side. It's a route both Tapper and Cook have flown before. 1,700 hours. Sir? The threat of terrorist attack means passengers are asked to identify their baggage. Sir? Amongst the intelligence experts on the flight is Assistant Sir? Chief Constable Brian Fitzsimmons. He's well known for helping mastermind a string of successes against the IRA. The passenger list is so sensitive, it's shredded on takeoff. Meanwhile, the ground crew finish their pre-flight checks. This is Foxtrot 4, Juliet 40. Are we clear to lift and taxi to departure point? This is Foxtrot 4, Juliet 40. Are we clear to lift and depart to Fort George? Okay, can we just hold on? Steady, hold steady. Clear above and behind. Clear to lift. 17.42. The journey time to Fort George Army Base is approximately two hours. You're playing off scratch then, Tony. I wish. I've been spending more time in the bunker than on the green recently. <laughs> North, northeast. The Chinook proceeds at low level across the Antrim Hills. En route, the crew make routine radio contact with RAF Kinloss in Scotland. Order Grove approach, this is Fox Truck 4, Juliet 40. Coasting out and changing to low level frequency. Oh, yeah. Hold on, steady. Oh, it's steady. Order Grove approach, this is Fox Truck 4, Juliet 40. Coasting out and changing to low level frequency. Seventeen fifty. Zulu Delta 576 flies out into the North Channel, the stretch of sea between Northern Ireland and Scotland. They are now 78 kilometers from their first waypoint, the lighthouse on the Mull of Kintyre, the rocky headland that runs off the Kintyre Peninsula. Scottish military, good afternoon. This is Fox Truck 4, Juliet 40. The Chinook arrives in Scottish airspace. Seventeen fifty-five. Out sailing, Mark Holbrook hears the sound of a large helicopter coming in low. Draft from the rotor, so it was that close. It was uh, below the level of the high cloud. 
I only looked at the aircraft for uh, a few seconds. I had no particular reason to keep my eye on it. Holbrook is the last person to see the helicopter in flight. Selecting current, turn port about 15 degrees. 15 degrees port, all right. Seventeen fifty nine. Quick, pull up! Pull up! Pull up! Give it up! <laughs> RAF Kinloss near Inverness in the north of Scotland. All clear, all clear. Dave Wally's mountain rescue team receive an urgent call. We were told it was a military helicopter, you know, a big one, a Chinook, and it crashed, and beacons were going off. It's a 60-minute flight away. Okay, there's 29 souls out there. They need us out there, prone so. Landing close to the crash site is impossible. The mist was very, very much down. We could only see the sea. We could see a bit of the lighthouse. It's gonna be one hell of a mess up there, man. Guys, guys, we can't land at the site. The only safe option is the lighthouse helipad. It was a bit windy, completely heavy, heavy sea heart. Uh, very, very poor visibility, but you can smell the smell of aviation. So you know the aircraft is not just crashed, it's been in fire. Carrying just first aid equipment, the rescue team make their way to the crash site, 300 meters up the mall. It took us 20 minutes to run in, and as we're coming in, we're finding more and more debris. This way! Over here! Oh. Huge fires, smoke billowing out, flames, and things going bang in bits and pieces because the aircraft had only crashed about an hour before. It was a Dante's Inferno. Even, you know, an hour after the crash, it was still a burning hell. We were hoping, with 29 um, people on board and a big aircraft, a big helicopter, that we would find some survivors. Time we'd located the first casualties, we were pretty sure nobody had survived because it must have hit the hill at f f pretty fast speed. 29 people are missing after a helicopter crashed in the west of Scotland. It hit a hill in thick fog. An eyewitness reported hearing a loud explosion and seeing a fireball. All 29 people on board are killed including the elite of Britain's security establishment and one of the RAF's most experienced Special Forces helicopter crews, including pilots Flight Lieutenant Rick Cook and Flight Lieutenant Jonathan Tapper. Within hours of the disaster, an 11-kilometer exclusion zone is set up around the crash site. While the security services scan the site for sensitive materials belonging to passengers, the RAF form a board of inquiry to investigate why an apparently routine flight has ended in the service's worst peacetime tragedy. Tony Cable was lead investigator for the Air Accident Investigation Board, the civil body tasked with the initial crash investigation. Zulu Delta 576, like the rest of the RAF Chinook fleet, isn't fitted with a black box recorder. So Cable has no way of knowing what was going on in the cockpit in the moments before the crash. 
There were no survivors, sadly, who could give a, an account of what happened. There were some ear witnesses, but there were no eyewitnesses who actually saw it crash. There was no radar recording, and uh, there was no recording of radio messages close to the time of the accident. So there was very little evidence to go on, apart from what came out of the, the crash site and the wreckage examination. Now, by rewinding the events of the day and going deep into the investigation, we can re-examine the tragedy to uncover what could have led to this accident. Within 24 hours, Tony Cable is walking the site of the crash, trying to understand the helicopter's last movements. Burning wreckage is strewn across an area of nearly two square kilometers. I estimated in this case that something like 80% of the aircraft had been affected by ground fire, and in the order of 20% of it had been destroyed. Cable's experienced eye spots the first significant clue. There were some very faint marks at the initial impact point, which you could match to the forward landing gear on the Chinook. The helicopter had first struck the hill on a rocky outcrop of the Mull at a height of 810 feet. It had suffered a glancing blow on an outcrop of rock, uh, not doing a great deal of damage, and had then progressed airborne for almost 200 meters before the main part of the aircraft had a heavy impact further up the hill and broke into two or three parts. The absence of scarring from the rotor blades around the impact point gives Cable an understanding of the position of the Chinook at the time. The flight path angle was in the order of 20 degrees above the horizontal, so a climbing flight path. The aircraft attitude was nose up around about 30 degrees, and the aircraft banked in the order of 5 to 10 degrees to the left. These details give a snapshot of the Chinook's last moment, but they offer no explanation as to why it crashed. With so many high-ranking anti-terrorist personnel on board, sabotage must be a consideration for crash investigators. In the immediate aftermath of the crash, suspicions fall on IRA involvement. Two months previously, an RAF Lynx helicopter was shot down over Northern Ireland. The single mortar, equivalent to a 250-pound bomb, traveled 150 yards over residents' rooftops. The Lynx, like this one, was hit in the tail at 100 feet as it came into land. We had a good look back well before the impact point. By foot and low level in a helicopter, just studying the area back to the coast along the projected flight path. If he can find any part of the chopper separated from the bulk of the wreckage, it could indicate an in-flight explosion. But we'd found no signs of any further wreckage, anything having detached from the aircraft before it had made its initial impact. A terrorist act is quickly ruled out. It leaves Cable with only two possibilities, mechanical failure or pilot error. Cable examines the actuators, part of the hydraulic system that allows the pilot to control the two separate sets of rotors on the Chinook. The position of the actuators gives an indication as to what the Chinook was doing in its final seconds. It turned out that they were, in fact, indicating different airspeeds, which 
suggested either there was a fault somewhere or the maneuver was being undertaken. The RAF asks the Chinook's manufacturer, Boeing, to run a computer simulation based on Cable's findings. The simulation determines that the aircraft was traveling at approximately 150 knots with a rate of climb of 1,000 feet per minute, a fast ground speed but a slow rate of climb. A few seconds before impact, it made a sharp pull up, a flare in helicopter parlance. It's the helicopter equivalent of an emergency stop, suggesting that the crew only saw the hillside at the last moment. My lords, I have followed closely the various inquiries which have taken place to establish the cause of this tragic accident, and I... Lord Glen Arthur, a former Army helicopter pilot, took a particular interest in the crash. The positions of the controls were in exactly the position you'd expect them to find after a last-minute attempt to avoid contact with the ground. You, you suddenly see ground, sugar, you pull back on the stick, you probably pull up on the, on the lever of the snare, and you probably put a boot of the rudder in to initiate the turn away. It was an instinctive reaction at a moment of very, very high drama, which they had not been expecting, is how I would, I would, I, I would describe it. The board concludes that this evasive action means the pilots were in control of the aircraft a few seconds before the crash. Cable hopes the Chinook's navigational computer, recovered intact at the crash site, might reveal more. But deemed classified equipment by the RAF, it's sent to the manufacturer for analysis. The device reveals that approximately 18 seconds before the crash, the Chinook's altitude is between four and 500 feet. Cable is also told that at 1.5 kilometers from the lighthouse on the Mall, the Chinook's first waypoint, a crew member manually requested their next heading, a waypoint change. The computer indicated that a left turn on a bearing of between 10 and 15 degrees was required to hit their next waypoint, the village of Corran in the Scottish Highlands. To the RAF, the waypoint change is evidence that the pilots were in control of the aircraft for the whole flight and that they subsequently decided against making the turn. While Cable continues analyzing the wreckage for clues, the RAF Board of Inquiry concentrates on the actions of the pilots. They planned to fly under what are known as visual flight rules. We're flying VFR. Visual flight rules were that they should remain at all times 1,000 meters clear of cloud. But the RAF Board of Inquiry believes the crew should have been flying under instruments rules. Based on the weather forecast and the reports of witnesses on the Mull, the board believes as the Chinook approaches the peninsula, clear skies give way to some low mist and fog. It's like going down the motorway and you know, running into fog. You, you, you are immediately putting yourself in extreme danger. The board decides that by the time of their last recorded altitude of four to 500 feet, the crew are in cloud. To comply with navigation rules, the pilots need to slow to a hover and climb to a safe altitude, in this case, 2,800 feet. The aircraft crashed at just over 800 feet. They were 2,000 feet below the height that they should have been if they were in instrument meteorological conditions, which is what they were. 
The RAF Board of Inquiry concludes that the crew decided to ignore the waypoint change and fly over the mull instead, but chose the wrong rate of climb to clear the hillside. In the absence of any concrete proof of mechanical failure, the RAF now come up with their version of what happened to Zulu Delta 576. Scottish military, good afternoon. This is Fox Prop 4, Juliet 40. Four minutes to disaster. Jonathan Tapper contacts Scottish military air traffic control. Twenty-three seconds to disaster. With the lighthouse 1.5 kilometers away, a crew member requests a bearing for the next waypoint on their flight path. Instead of turning left to head along the coast as planned, they continue onwards into thick fog, intending to fly over the mull. They should now slow right down and turn away from the high ground, or switch to instrument navigation and climb at the maximum rate to a safe height. But they do neither. Traveling at high speed towards the rocky hillside, they begin a gentle climb. Approximately four seconds to disaster, the mull appears out of the fog. The pilot attempts evasive action. The helicopter's nose comes up, and it begins to roll to the left. Pull up! But it's going too fast to avoid the hillside. When you look at all the facts, you have to be bold enough and brave enough to say, I'm sorry, I can find no other reason. This is going to be unpleasant for me to have to announce, but nevertheless, they had breached their duty of care and that therefore they were, I'm afraid, grossly negligent. For the RAF hierarchy, the case is closed. We found together in our brief that 12 months ago, we reflect on what happened on this spot. But the pilots, families, and supporters refuse to accept the conclusions of the board's reviewing officers. At the time of the crash, squadron leader Robert Burke was the unit test pilot at RAF Odium, the unofficial headquarters of the Chinook fleet. Burke knew both Tapper and Cook. He believes the RAF's assertion that such experienced pilots would have willingly pressed on in bad weather and towards high ground is wrong. To climb straight ahead into high ground is the last thing any experienced pilot's gonna do. It's crazy, unless they both went crazy at the time. They're not that kind of pilots. Either. They're very steady by the book pilots. Burke has publicly contested the finding of pilot error and believes mechanical failure might be to blame. The selection of the next waypoint, the turn, is an indication that up to that point, the aircraft was under control. It gives you no indication of what might have happened to the aircraft after the waypoint. The pilot's families also argue that it's possible the crew could see the lighthouse at the time of the waypoint change allowing them to continue legitimately under visual flight rules and casting doubt on the RAF's assertion that the mull was totally shrouded in fog. Yachtsman Mark Holbrook was three kilometers southwest of the lighthouse when he saw the Chinook fly over. I could see where the cloud was, and, and there were, I was not in cloud. I was not in fog, and neither was the aircraft. Holbrook describes cloud and hill fog, extending from around the base of the lighthouse at 250 feet above sea level, up towards the summit of the mall.
But if pilot error is not the reason for the crash, another cause must be found. Why would the crew go straight on and fly into the hillside when there were indications they should have turned? I have no idea unless they were having technical problems with the aircraft. The spotlight now falls on mechanical failure. Cable believes clues might be found in the new computer system controlling the Chinook's engines. FADEC, Full Authority Digital Engine Control. In the months preceding the incident, pilots at the Boscombe Down test facility described FADEC as positively dangerous. In the six weeks before the crash, the computer controlling the engines on a number of new Chinooks fails five times. News of these unresolved problems lead Tapper to request Zulu Delta 576's entrance into operational service be delayed. Hello, Dad. I actually asked if we could take out one of the old Chinooks. They, they said no. The flight's in two days, but I, I don't think they're going to change their mind. On June the 1st, 1994, pilots at Boscombe Down suspend all further test flights. Yet Tapper is still instructed to pilot the new Chinook the following day. Cable discovers that part of the new Chinook's FADIC system, the digital electronic control units, had been replaced twice in the week before the crash because of engine startup problems. These control units, or DECUs, regulate the fuel supply to each of the Chinook's two engines to maintain safe flight. The reason for being particularly interested in these was that they each contained memory, which potentially would give an indication of the power that was set on each engine at the point of impact. During his investigation of the crash site, Tony Cable found these control units. One was in quite good condition, a uh, bit of impact damage, but no fire damage. The other one was severely fire damaged, with the circuit boards really toasted. Cable sends the engine control unit to the manufacturers, Textron Lycoming, for analysis. There were some error codes found in the uh, number two DECU memories. Unfortunately, there is no record on the memory of when a particular error code occurred. So at the end of the day, it was not possible to say whether any of them had occurred on the final flight. The error code, a so-called E5 error, is dismissed by the manufacturers as normal. In fact, unknown to cable, this error had been seen before. In 1989, the RAF were testing the then new FADIC engine control system at Boeing's plant in Wilmington, Delaware, when an accident occurred. The Chinook was badly damaged. Engine software expert Malcolm Perks was called in by the MOD to investigate. What had happened was that the rotor systems on the Chinook had run up in an uncontrolled manner to some very high speed before it was caught and shut down. Too much fuel had been supplied to one of the engines, leading to uncontrolled lift. A software fault in the FADIC system, producing an E5 error code, is subsequently blamed for the Wilmington accident. I thought that was strange. Here we were, several years after the Wilmington accident, with same fault codes occurring that had occurred then, and apparently no fix had been introduced to do anything about them. Robert Burke experienced such an engine run-up on two occasions. If you're flying along just beneath the cloud, indeed, as ZD-576 was doing, it could put you into cloud effectively instantaneously. 
If this happened while flying on visual flight rules, it would be easy to lose track of your location. Scottish military, good afternoon. This is Fox Top 4, Juliet 40. In this alternative scenario, the Chinook is approaching the Mull when the pilots spot heavy cloud ahead. Looks a bit murky up ahead, cut the corner. 23 seconds to disaster. A crew member selects the waypoint change. Selecting current, turn port about 15 degrees. 15 degrees port, aye. Right. The navigational computer instructs the pilot to turn left. Suddenly, there's a FADEC malfunction. One of the Chinook's engines overruns. We've got to run away up and rotor over speed. Bloody hell. With the rotors spinning out of sync, the Chinook starts to shake violently. Against the wishes of the pilots, the aircraft starts to climb, pulling it into heavy cloud. No visibility! I'm raising the lever to contain the NR. The crew struggle to get the aircraft under control. The aircraft's engine run-up means it's climbing, but at an insufficient rate to avoid the hillside. Pull up, pull up! And in cloud, under visual flight rules, the crew are no longer sure of their position. Oh, Lord. Pull up, Rick! Pull up! Pull up! Pull up. Give it up! The RAF believes the crew were in control of the aircraft from the waypoint change to the crash. This FADIC fault scenario suggests they may not have been. It may be that FADIC could not have caused the Mull of Kintyre crash, but it could have been a contributory factor to the situation that the pilots found themselves in that day. We'll never know. But a FADIC fault is not the only possible mechanical failure scenario. Tony Cable believes a physical jam within the pilot's flight controls could also be to blame. He retrieves what's called the flight control closet from the crash site, a small, cramped, boxed unit that sits behind the pilot. Rods and cabling from the pilot's controls run through here to the rotors. On examining the aircraft's service record, Cable discovers that three weeks before the accident, components had come loose in this control closet. The actual detachment of the bracket itself was not a huge deal, but uh, it was a very tightly confined area, and it appeared quite likely that uh, this could possibly jam one or more controls so the pilots would be unable to remove that particular control. Not a good situation on a flight control system. Cable examines the recovered flight control closet. A number of these components, quite a lot of them, had detached from the panel. But yet again, the evidence is not conclusive. There seemed to be no way to determine whether they had detached due to impact forces or might possibly have come out pre-impact and caused a flight control problem. But the control closet evidence, when combined with other physical evidence from the crash site, suggest the controls could have jammed. Cable had assessed that the left rudder pedal had been pushed three quarters of the way down before the crash. The RAF took this as evidence that avoidance action was being taken. But Robert Burke believes otherwise. It's an extraordinary amount of left rudder to put in, even under extreme circumstances when you're flying at maximum speed. You would virtually never do that unless you had a problem with the aircraft. Rather than generating a banked curve, depressing the rudder pedal merely rotates a helicopter on its axis. It's a highly unusual maneuver to perform at speed. This to any pilot, any helicopter pilot, any pilot of any kind, would suggest that the aircraft was not fully under control at the time it crashed. 
Burke believes Rick Cook may have used such heavy rudder as an avoidance measure because he was unable to steer the helicopter away from the mall any other way. I've got a control jam! Cut! Such a situation could have come about if his cyclic, the stick, controlling forward and lateral movement, stopped working. A so-called control jam. Cut! Turn the aircraft! At the original inquiry, Boeing stated that this was extremely improbable. But just three years after the crash of Zulu Delta 576, a US pilot experienced the control jam as his Chinook dropped out of the sky. It was flying along in the cruise at 1,000 feet above ground, and uh, the nose went to one side, the pilot corrected, and the aircraft then started to roll rolled onto its side 90 degrees uh, in spite of all the efforts of the pilots to stop it. Although all attempts to identify the source of the crippling control jam proved fruitless, it's evidence that they do happen. Scottish military, good afternoon. This is Fox Truck 4, Juliet 40. In this third scenario, where a control jam is the cause of the crash, the crew are following their planned flight path and can see the lighthouse, their first waypoint. Looks a bit murky up ahead. Cut the corner. 23 seconds to disaster. They request a bearing for their next waypoint. Selecting Corin, turn port about 15 degrees. 15 degrees port, all right. The computer instructs them to turn left, away from the mall. But as they attempt the turn, a problem with the controls becomes apparent. Got a control jam! Not responding! Unable to turn, they're heading for the cloud-covered mountain at high speed. Quick, pull the collective! To avoid the mull, they need to slow the aircraft right down and turn away. Quick, pull up! <laughs> or climb immediately at the maximum rate to a safe height. But with the control stick jammed, they can't reduce their speed. Pulling the thrust control to force the chopper to ascend only results in a gradual climb. Seeing the mountain ahead, Cook attempts evasive action by pushing the left rudder pedal to get the aircraft to hover to the left. It's not enough. In retrospect, looking back at my statement to the Board of Inquiry, uh, I would have emphasized the aspect that the absence of finding a failure does not mean that there was no failure there. The possibility in this case that there was a malfunction of some system that prevented the pilots from taking the aircraft where they intended it to go uh, cannot be dismissed. Whether that technical malfunction is due to a fadig problem. We've got to run away up and rotor to overspeed. Bloody hell! No visibility! Or another kind of mechanical failure. I've got a control jack! Not responding! Rick, pull up! We'll never be known. In 2001, a House of Lords committee recommended the finding of gross negligence against the pilots be revoked, on the basis that this verdict can only be applied when there is no doubt whatsoever. Ten years later, in 2011, the Ministry of Defense ordered the gross negligence verdict set aside. The cause of the accident was officially changed to unknown.
Why did the Americans bomb Nagasaki? Brand new Seconds from Disaster investigates next Monday at 9. Stay tuned for Air Crash Investigation.